Welcome back to TarHillIllustrated.com. And if you're watching on our YouTube channel, Tar Hill Illustrated, I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner. And joining me, as he usually does, THI publisher Andrew Jones. Andrew, we're switching it up today. We've been talking a lot of football recently. It's, it's that time of year, understandably. We've been, we've been had a ton of media availability, ton of stuff going on football-wise as Carolina's approaching closer and closer to their season opener against Syracuse on September 12th. But like I said, we're here to talk some basketball. Um, UNC not far away from, from starting practice now. Only a few weeks out in terms of that. AJ, first thing we got to touch on. I know Carolina fans, I know our subscribers are not going to want to relive last year in any way, shape, or form. We're going to try to keep it. We're, we're going to try to not focus on too much of that, but focus on one particular part of that. Obviously, Carolina finishing 14 and 19. We got to touch on Roy. I mean, Roy's coming off a year that he's never had before as a coach. What, what do you think? Are we going to see – what is last year – I'm trying to figure out how I should phrase this question. What is last year, you think, taught Roy – and are we, we going to see a different Roy this year, a more hungrier Roy this year, um, maybe a less forgiving Roy this year because of how last year played out? You know, the last time either one of us were actually at something to cover was the Syracuse game in the ACC tournament. Yep. And that was – a rather unbecoming sight if you uh, view things through a Carolina blue lens. Uh, Roy wasn't happy that night. It was just one of the weirdest nights of my career. Now, to specifically answer your question, I think that Roy's hunger is going to be on a very high level this year. It's always very high. For, for some of the baseball fans watching ESPN about 15 years ago when they were advertising their Sunday night baseball, they had a great ad where they showed some old you know managers from like the, the 20s and 30s where it, it, it was simulated to look like that and they talked about the fire in the belly well Roy's the fire in Roy's belly is going to be off the charts this year because if, if any and, and I love his I care more my pinky than everybody else does combined but I don't think that that's a stretch I've been around him enough I don't think that's a stretch this guy is incredibly passionate and he's an uber focus and has an extremely high standard. And I believe that he will be as zeroed in, laser zeroed in as much as he's ever been this season. Cause he's coming off something that was, that he'd never experienced before. And it was ugly in so many ways. And, and part of it was he didn't have options, which he's gonna have this year. And I think because he has those options, his standards will be off the charts. And he knows right now, he never says, well, gee, we can win 26 games or, he doesn't do that kind of stuff. But he knows where the team can be in his mind just when he sits there and watches them during the game and what his expectation levels are. He knows where they can be, I think, by the middle of March. That's a pretty good idea. And that's the standard he's going to coach them to throughout the year. So you're going to see a lot of energy. Um, probably not going to, you know, I, mean, I think that they're going to win games and we'll see angry Roy in the postgame press conference because he understands what he has to push this team to. A lot of that stuff stopped last year after that three-game losing streak in January at home to Clemson, Pitt, and Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. Then his message changed a little bit. So I think we'll see a different Roy, a, a, a fiery Roy after wins. I, and uh, we're going to see him push this mule as far as he can. AJ, you talked about having a lot more options this year. Before we go in to those options, the specific players that he has, we know Roy's a guy that he doesn't mind going to his bench. Uh, we've talked about it so many times last year where you could, we were at every game. I mean, you were at every game, maybe on the road too. And you, you'd see it, you'd even text the group message that we have a lot. And you'd say, Roy, would look at the bench in a lot of these close games and, and not even close games, just in games that they should win. And he would look at his options when he needed to put somebody in. And, and he would almost just kind of look at him for a second and then turn his head like, I can't put those guys in. I can't trust those guys. And Roy didn't have the bench last year that he's accustomed to having. And he just, plain and simply, just didn't have it. I know Roy's a guy that doesn't mind yanking players out when they do something wrong and putting somebody else in to see if they can do it right. Do you think we'll see more of that this year just because Roy has so much more of an abundance of options that he just hasn't had in, the, in over a year now, really? <laughs> I think Roy this year is going to be the Roy he'd always been until last year. So it's going to be return to Roy in a sense. I, look, we did the games that you covered last year, which was all the home games and, and quite a few road games. We would do a stand up after the game 
And I was telling you in early November, we discussed it in, in November. And he looks at that bench, he's got no options. I, mean, I don't know how many times I saw him look over there where in the past he'd pull someone up. It's not a yank a guy out and chew him out. They got to know when the mistakes are. You know, the, the, the bench, coaches will tell you the bench is the best motivator sometimes that you can have. And he didn't have that a year ago. But it also wasn't just a matter of trying to teach guys, just to try to get better by putting someone on the floor who could play better. Didn't really have those options last year. And um, he didn't ever shake his head like, oh, shucks, I got nobody. But you could tell probably in his head he's probably shaking his head because he didn't have those, those options there. He will now. And I think because of that, we're going to see a lot of different things that were not at all a part of last year's team. Uh, and are more like the teams we've seen in previous years. He's going to have a lot of bodies at his disposal. And if if Anthony Harris is 100% healthy and playing, and if he gets something from Kerwin Walton, something from, from Puff Johnson, he's going to go 10, 11 deep. So we'll see a variety of things that he does, especially early in the year, depending on how the early part of the non-conference schedule is going to lay out with all the COVID stuff. So I think – Old Roy, which is only 16, 18 months ago, I think that guy's going to be back in a lot of ways. And I think Carolina fans will, will consider that a welcome sight. For sure, for sure. I think it's going to be going to be refreshing to see that old Roy. That's always been one of my favorite things is, you know, when you see a guy mess up on the floor for Carolina, you just always immediately look over to Roy and just watch him look down that bench and tell somebody to go in. That's what always been one of my favorite things about watching Roy. And, and, the, and the player will come off the court. A Royal will reach out and give a little hand tap, like a finger, yeah. like an end of the finger tap. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he won't look at him. <clears throat> and and the, the play will resume. And 30, 40 seconds later, when everybody's watching the court, not the player that came out, we're all kind of go there and say something. Yeah, go talk to him a little bit. Because they don't want to show the kid up. They don't want to embarrass him. <laughs> Absolutely not. That's always been one of my favorite. I, I love watching when he does that because it's his way of doing things. And yeah. you have to appreciate it. You have to respect it because – Hey, the, the results, the results speak very loudly with him. Absolutely, and we've talked about those options, AJ. Let's dive into them right now. We'll start <clears> with <throat> the returners that Carolina has from last year's team. You got Garrison Books, obviously, Leaky Black, Armando Bacot. Um, you've also got Andrew Playtech as well. You can even throw Anthony Harrison there, but didn't really play a lot last year. He is a guy that's coming back, but hasn't played a lot of college basketball as of yet. So, let's focus on those four guys. I think having Garrison back is obviously huge. I think Leakey was a little bit up and down last year. Injuries played a lot of that. I think Armando had showed glimpses of what he can be and also showed glimpses of why he was a true freshman last year. And I think Andrew Playtech as well. I think Andrew Playtech was just kind of the unfortunate scapegoat for a lot of Carolina fans that just he deserved, he had a lot of criticism that, quite frankly, I think we can both agree. I don't think he deserved. Um, but, AJ, looking at those four guys that are coming back, what do you expect those guys to, to help this team? Uh, do, you, do you expect anybody to maybe take a big leap, kind of focus on Leakey and Armando and those two guys, and, and maybe Garrison Brooks having an even better season than he did last year? Because that's going to be tough for him to do, I think, especially when you look at the abundance of talent that Carolina has coming in uh, with, with True Freshman, which we'll touch on here in a few minutes. Yeah, as far as Garrison goes, uh, it really depends on, on how someone views what will be asked of him this year. Mm-hmm. He may not he, – he, he put it on his shoulders a lot last year, and as a result, scored a lot of points, especially from the Georgia Tech game on. You know, going into that Georgia Tech game when he went for, what, 33 and 11 or whatever, 35 and Something 13. Like that. Yeah, I think you're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was averaging 12 point, a little over 12 points a game. Mm-hmm. From that point afterward, he averaged close to 19. So he took it upon himself to score because they were having so many struggles, and that was during a period when Cole was out. So part of that was a guy scoring because someone had to score. Now, to his credit, his efficiency numbers didn't really drop off much when he was shooting more, higher volume of shots. And he really started to show a lot of things in his game. He didn't show up to that point. Roy said many times, it wasn't that Garrison developed those moves during the course of the year. He learned to trust those moves during the course of the year. And once he started to trust the whole of his game, we started to see more variety to what he was doing. And it even got to the point where after that disastrous stretch at the free throw line, especially at home, he actually closed the season the last eight games or so, shooting over 80% from the line. So he found himself during the course of the year as much as any guy I can recall covering at UNC or any of the programs in the area. So I think what you might see from Garrison going in is he's, he's already done enough where he can establish himself as the absolute leader of this team. 
He's the go-to guy when the season starts. And he's also a guy who's extending his game out because they're going to have other options down low. Garrison did that a lot last year when Justin Pierce was the four. So think about the doubling down on him and the fact he was still able to get stuff up and get numbers. Now there are other dudes that have to be guarded. Daron Sharp's got David Sisk, or David Sisk did an amazing scouting report on Daron Sharp last week. He's got very polished low post moves. He's a traditional low post guy. So Garrison can step away. And I know Garrison's been spent the entire offseason working a ton on his perimeter shooting. And, and if he's going to make money at the next level playing this game, he's going to have to have that part to his game. So we might see a little bit more of that. We might see a little different Garrison Brooks. He's still going to be a really good rebounder. He's still going to be a smart guy. He's still going to be a good defensive player. And I think with the way he handled himself through last year, and it was very difficult. And there were some games I talked to him after a couple of losses where it was a challenge. And I commend him for actually – Manning up and talking to us because I know it was extremely difficult because let's remember this kid came in the year after a national championship. His first midnight madness, the uh, madness, the, the Roy, or late night with Roy, the banner was unveiled. That's the culture he immersed himself into initially. And last year was 14 and 19 in a mess in so many ways. So I think Garrison has a lot of pride in understanding of what he's involved in and he will try to reinsert, that do his part to reinsert that culture that he came into. And he's going to do that in a lot of ways people won't see. And I think one of those ways is he's not going into the season thinking, I got to score 19 points a game. He's going to score whatever volume of points the, the, the situation will dictate and or mandate based on what the other guys are doing. And I think that's the greatest value he will add to the team this year. What about well, folks staying with the big man? What about Armando Bacot? You talked about him having really good traditional post um, big man moves. Do you, do you expect to see a, a pretty big leap from him in terms of production this year? Because, I, like I said, I think we saw glimpses of it, but we also saw glimpses of why he was a true freshman. You, he, he had some games when he played like a true freshman. What are your thoughts on, on Armando's kind of where you expect him to be this year? Not every player is on the same course. Everyone, you know, each athlete's course is like a fingerprint. It's unique. It's their own. And Armando's course is maybe a little different than what some people had hoped. One of the things that being around and, know, and speaking to people who know him, one of the things he had to do was just kind of mature as a whole and being in college for a year and being on a team that, that struggling to live up to its standard is a process that really helped mature him a lot. My understanding is that he's kind of worked through those freshman young guy figuring things out veins and he's a lot more solidified in understanding who he is as a player, you know, his, his point of being there, why he's there, what he's trying to achieve for himself individually, and then how that affects the greater whole of the team. So a more mature Armando Bacot to me is going to just be a lot better player. You'll find more consistency as a result. Uh, I think you'll find a guy who makes fewer quote unquote dumb fouls, those fouls in the backcourt reaching on, on a hedge 20 feet from the basket, that kind of stuff. So you, he'll be a, a clear minded player. And uh, because of that, he's going to be a better player. I mean, his numbers weren't bad last year. When you look, a true freshman who was at, what, what was he, nine points and eight rebounds in that range? I think it's something around there, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if he just improves by 15% and then is consistent, going to be a much better player and make them a much better team. So as far as what he adds to his game, I, <clears throat> I'm not sure. I think just more polish. I think he needs to be better with the left hand and um, make better decisions. And if he's not going to shoot the ball, he needs to get rid of it and kick it back out to the perimeter a little bit quicker, things like that. But I think Armando has got a significant upside. And if everything comes together for him this year, he could be a breakout player. He's got those tools, those abilities. Let's we'll have to wait and see. But I, Everything I've heard, very positive about him taking some of those really important steps that opened the door to becoming a really good player. For sure, for sure. I think having an even better Armando Bacot this year, because like I said, he wasn't horrible last year. He, like you mentioned, he did some really good things as a freshman and just had some of those games and some of those moments where you're like, as he matures and gets better, that aspect of his game will go away and it's just, you know, ceiling's the roof. And it's, it's not mind. unlike most people, just in life. I mean, oh, absolutely! I'm, yeah. I'm glad nobody <clears throat> was critiquing how I did things when I was 19 years oh, old. Man, because me either. <laughs> Twitter would have crushed me back oh, then. Man, I'll be, I'll be done. It probably crushes me now anyway. But <laughs> I, that's one of the things I love about covering 
college athletics is seeing guys come in and just grow and mature. And I've told you before, Jacob, once you get the full cycle of seeing a freshman class become seniors, think back to when you talk to them as freshmen and then look at the interviews you do with them when they're seniors. There's such a dramatic change. And that is one of my favorite things about doing this. And I don't know how long Armando's going to be there, but the last time any of us interview him as a Tar Heel, it's going to be a big difference from the first time. Sure. And, and he will be more prepared for whatever it is he goes on and takes on in life as a result. I love that. Yeah, great point, Ted. Yeah, it's going to be fun to see how, how – I think in particular how Garrison Brooks and our Armando McCott continue to evolve this year because if you can get the, both those guys playing at a high level consistently this year, I mean, this Carolina team is going to benefit a lot from it. Let's talk on about the last two guys before we move on to the freshmen in terms of returners, uh, Leaky Black, Andrew Playtech. Uh, my, I think one of the – we talked about this a lot last year. I'll never forget it. It was – I want to say it was after late night with Roy Scrimmage or maybe it was before the late night with Roy Scrimmage. It was sometime around there where Roy Williams basically said that he thought uh, Leaky Black was an NBA player. He thought he had a lot of potential of getting to that level. I think Leaky Black didn't have the year that, uh, that Roy expected him to have and maybe probably that Leaky Black didn't expect to have. And I think a lot of that had to do with injuries. We know he had a lot of these little nagging injuries. And I think when we saw him get a little bit fully or healthier towards the end of the season, we started seeing a little bit more consistency and improvement out of him. Um, and with Playtech, I think it's a, a thing where he was kind of a scapegoat for this team. He was a guy that people were blaming for Carolina's struggles last year. Um, and that just wasn't the case. Uh, there was a lot of other reasons that Carolina was not a good basketball team last year besides Andrew Playtech. But focusing on those two guys, and in my opinion with Leakey is, you know, he's getting up there a little bit, junior season – do you think this is kind of a year, make or break year for Leakey in terms of if he doesn't develop a little bit more of a consistent jump shot, if he doesn't put a little bit higher numbers up, if he doesn't prove a little bit more to people that it might be his, is it kind of his make or break year in terms of hoping to play at that next level someday, do you think? Or is, do you, do you, is it just, is it too early to tell in terms of well, that? I'm not sure that would be fair to put that on him, especially when we don't, 100% know what his role on his team is going to be. Mm -hmm. They're going to have, on paper, they have quite a few other scoring options. And I think if you judge Leaky Black's game based on the number of points he scores, then you're not really watching the whole of his game. I think that Leaky's got a lot of – people want to call him the next Theo Pinson and stuff like that. Well, Leaky's not the same athlete Theo is, no. but, he, but he's long. He's got great vision. He's a better ball handler than Theo was entering his junior year. Um, he's a different kind of player uh, than, than Theo was in a lot of ways, although this, this, the stat sheet, the box score may look somewhat the same. I think for Leakey, first of all, you have to understand, and, and I think it was June last year, it was Roy's summer press conference, yeah, he said June, that, and a lot of us thought, well, I think what that did was that everyone else's expectations for Leakey mm -hmm. skyrocketed, and we spent, how many times did we talk to other media? You know, that cover opposing teams, and they would, well, what's up with Leakey Black? really underperforming and we said well I mean he's we're waiting to see what Roy was telling us that we would see mm -hmm. but you have to understand that the turf toe that he had was a significant injury as I think it was Garrison at one point said Mick have you ever had turf toe someone asked him about Leakey and his response was have you ever had turf toe if you haven't had it then you have no clue you don't understand for a guy who plays basketball to have turf toe nagging him almost the entire season as Leakey did. It's, just, it's a considerable thing, especially when you consider the fact that he's the three for a while. He's a two. He oh, played point God. guard in a seven or about an eight game stretch uh, after they ran through point guard central. You know, when Cole went down, they ran through point guards uh, <laughs> like it was going out of style. And then they set on Leakey and they played pretty well. They, that, that loss up at Virginia Tech that went in a couple overtimes, Leakey played well that night. I think he had nine rebounds and eight assists or something, and he was directing the offense. They looked decent that night, and they ended up winning a couple of games before Cole came back, and Leakey was at the point. He was starting to get comfortable. He played the point in high school. Then you go down to Louisville, and he starts it before, and he played some four even in Greensboro. So, you know, to his – in fairness to him – he was asked to do a lot of things while injured. There were some other nagging things going on. And I think confidence took a hit for a while as well. He never attempted more than 10 shots in a game last year. And I think he only did it four times. So on a team that needs scoring, 
when you're an older guy, even though he's a sophomore, he's still older than some of their dudes and been in the program longer, and he still only attempted 10 shots, to me that tells me the confidence wasn't there. It also says that the turf tail was inhibiting his ability to drive and create a lot of stuff for himself. So 100% healthy, we're going to see a lot more out of, out of, out of Leakey. I think we'll see a better offensive player, not just – his ability to score the ball and how he does it. But I think the way he makes everybody better, he could be a really good glue guy who can also put some points up every once in a while if things play out the way that I think – that I see it, and I think the way he probably does too. And he prides himself on making that assist. He prides himself on being a glue guy and making the unit better. He prides himself on trying to be a better communicator on defense and all those things. He cares about the way – Carolina has played the game in the past, and I, I know he would love to see it happen again and, and be a big part of it, even if it means he's not scoring 15 points a game. Do not judge him on his point totals. If he gets up to 10 or 12 a game, that's a great thing for UNC, but I wouldn't judge him solely on that. What about Andrew Blake, that last guy we'll touch on before we move um, to the freshman? I, I, like, do, you, do you see his role being kind of that bit part role player that he's been, or now that he's kind of that veteran guy? Do you see him maybe maybe playing a little bit bigger of a role? Or is it something we're just going to have to see and, and kind of based on what happens in the beginning of the year and, and getting into ACC play and stuff like that? Well, I think, like some guys, Andrew was probably put in a position to maybe feel like he had to do more than should be asked of in in ACC games last year. And as much confidence as he expresses – there were times where it just didn't seem like it was there. And, and, I, and I think that you could tell yourself, you could tell the media, I can do this. I'm an ACC player. I'm a North Carolina player. I should be able to do all these things. But then you get on the court, there's a little bit of doubt. Doubt makes you slower. Doubt makes you less quick. Uh, doubt makes you um, – your, your mind doesn't operate as quickly as it needs to. You, you, you second-guess this move. You second-guess that move in, in almost subconsciously. And I think Andrew kind of went through some of that last year. I think Andrew's a good player. Mm -hmm. And I think Andrew's a guy that can really help this team in, in a more solidified, narrower role on the team. And that, that could mean playing a lot of minutes. I know one thing. that When you watched him play last year, <clears throat> they were usually a little bit better defensively when he was on the court because he's a really good help side defender. And if you understand basketball, you know the importance of that. If you don't have good help side defense, <clears throat> especially if you have a system where – Coach plays man most of the time, and you overplay at times. You got to be able to have that help side defense there. It's one of five on the floor, and I think that even offensively at times, you know, Andrew knew where the ball was supposed to go. He knew where everybody was supposed to be, and it sounds like a small thing to a lot of people. But on last year's offense, with as much as that group struggled on the half court, as often as they just the the, the half court broke down quickly, Andrew at least is a guy that knew where to get the ball. So on this year's team, if he doesn't have to take shots like he had to take at times last year, and he's a facilitator on the floor and a guy who can give them a little gravitas and, and that dude that knows what's supposed to be going on, especially when they have a lot of young dudes on the floor at the same time, I think he can help this team a lot. He wants to be there. I used to laugh, and you, we've talked about this, Jacob, and I talked about it with somebody else in the staff. The last couple of off seasons, like late, late in February leading into the spring, I would run into people and they, oh, I hear Playtech's going to transfer. I hear Playtech's going to transfer. Yeah. I, what did I say? Mm -hmm. What did I tell you? I said, you guys need to understand how much he loves being a part of this program. Mm -hmm. You guys need to understand how much this guy wants to have the true Carolina experience and be a part of that. And that's why whatever role Roy has for him this year, he's going to embrace it and, make, and give his best ever. If it's five minutes a game or if it's 20 minutes a game, Andrew's going to run with it. He's going to do everything he can to, to help the team in whatever role that is. And you've got to have dudes like that in your program if you're going to be North Carolina because guys like that, in part, help define what North Carolina has been for so long. The great programs have guys like that. Mm -hmm. And so having a guy like Andrew this year, I think he could really turn out to surprise a lot of people who have been down on him because he could be a comfortable player on the floor for the other guys. And I think that's the probably the greatest uh, value he will bring to the court. And to the team in general. In mm -hmm. practice, they're running drills. Andrew knows all the drills. I mean, Andrew knows everything that Roy wants them to do. He just maybe wasn't blessed with some of the same gifts that a few other dudes have been blessed with. But he's an important part of this process. There's no doubt about it.
Absolutely. Having a veteran guy like him that's not going to go out there and, and fill up the stat sheet or you're not going to play at the next level is still huge. A guy that's been around the program, knows the standard, knows the level they want to be at. I think Andrew Playtech definitely has an important role to play for the Tar Heels this season. AJ, let's switch our focus over to the freshmen before we end it. Start with the big men, Walker Kessler and Dayron Sharp. A lot of hype with them coming in. Two really talented guys. I've had the opportunity to see Dayron Sharp play in person a few times. Haven't had that with Walker Kessler, but I've obviously watched a ton of video on him. How do you see Walker and Dayron coming in and contributing to this team, especially when you consider you've got a really veteran, really talented guy in Garrison Brooks and Armando Baycott that came in with those kind of same expectations that they have, but still have a, has a lot of um, uh, proving to do. What do you see those guys coming in, and, and what kind of impact do you see them having? Uh, they'll have an impact. I, I think both of them will play. They'll play a lot. They'll, they'll make Carolina better. Uh, last year, the Tar Heels were probably a better rebounding team than, than on paper they should have been because Roy is one of the great rebounding coaches of all time, maybe the best in, the, in college basketball, and he coaches teams how to rebound so well. This team could be an awesome rebounding team because they're always going to have two of those guys on the floor, yeah. almost always. There might be times to go a little bit smaller, but – He's got those guys. Dayron Sharp is going to play. He's going. To, he's ready to play right now. Walker Kessler is ready to play right now. They're a little bit different players, and I'm not going to say one's going to play more than the other. One of them may start. We don't know. But they will help. They'll be a part of the rotation. If Garrison's playing 20 or you know 32 minutes instead of 30 in a big game, Garrison's productive level for the minutes per, uh, he plays will be higher. Uh, Armando, you know, if Armando gets that quick second foul, you don't have to set him to the bench and think, my gosh, I've got Pierce or Leakey at the four right now, and I got no other options, and Garrison's on an island out there. Everything just changes because those guys are not just there, but they're going to be ready to help out. So I, based on what David Sisk has said about Dayron, I'm really looking forward to him being out there because he's a traditional Roy Williams big guy. He's got the lower block moves. He's got the jump hooks with both hands. You know, he can do the drop step, the spin. He can use his body, kind of back in, turn and score. And, uh, you know, Carolina needs guys like that. When Carolina wins, he wins big. And when Roy wins big, he's got guys like that on the roster. He's got one now in Dayron Sharp. And I think Kessler's a guy that has a lot of those same attributes, maybe steps away a little bit more. Um, everything I've heard from people who've seen him play say that he will – uh, do a lot of fun things for Carolina fans this year. Absolutely. I agree. I think they're going to have a big impact. I'm, I'm especially excited to, to see Dayron Sharp because, like I said, I've seen him play a few times in person. I like what he does. I like his size. I like his aggression. I like his athleticism. And then Walker Kessler as well. I think he's a guy that has the ability to stretch the floor a little bit with his jump shot too, at least from some of the highlights I've seen of him. Hey, just switch the focus. Well, over real, to real quickly, let me add. People who have seen them both play a lot say that one of the really important things about the two of them is they're two young big men who know their games. Yeah. They understand who they are. They're not going to walk into the college scene and try to show that there are a bunch of stuff they're not quite yet. They're not there yet. They're going to play within who they are. Roy's going to love that. Yeah. Oh, that whole look to the bench thing we were talking about earlier. You know, when Roy knows that he's going to put these guys out there and they're not going to do 500 knucklehead things, that's such a huge plus. Absolutely. Let's switch the focus over to Caleb Love uh, before we focus on the other guys after that. Um, Caleb, unless something crazy happens, that's your start, starting point guard right there. I think we can all agree with that. How important is he, AJ, to this team and where they want to go? And what kind of impact realistically do you think he has? What kind of season do you think he'll end up having for Carolina? As important as the big men are to Roy Williams teams being Roy Williams teams, and then Roy says rebounding is the most important stat, mm -hmm. without a doubt, the most important player on the floor is going to be the point guard. Sure. Uh, you, you, when Kobe White, when the light went on for him, and I think it went on in the Kentucky game in Chicago, even though they lost, I remember talking to him in the locker room after the game, and he was talking about things that the other guys didn't do well. He wasn't being critical. He was just saying, we need to do this better. We need to do that better. I've got to do a better job of this. Clearly, the light went on because a point guard doesn't just have to dribble the ball at the court and pass and score every once in a while. He's got to know everything that's going on. He's got to be the quarterback out there. He's got to be the chief out there. And when that happened with Kobe, the team kind of uh, 
other than the loss of him to Louisville, they, they really hit a nice stride there. They were much, much better after that. For Caleb Love, it's, the question is, when does he reach that point? And when he does, and I think he may do it sooner than Kobe did even, because remember, we had the Kobe Seventh Woods thing going on there for a while. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be Caleb from day one. And everything that I understand about his game and talking to people who have seen him a lot, they say he's a guy that will get it. I mean, Roy will, won't have to tell him something 15 times. Tell him once or twice, and he'll get it. And he'll do his best to execute it. And because the team is young, because the team is now the program is used to having freshman point guards, it, I don't think the transition for him to be a voice that's heard by the other guys is going to be that difficult. Think about it. Garrison Brooks and Andrew Playtech, this will be the third year in a row now with a third different point guard. The mm-hmm. same with Leakey. So they're used to 18, 19-year-olds barking out stuff, being the guy. At, on the ball. And I think that's important because that wasn't, that was such a new thing when Kobe ended up winning that job. So then you look at all the skills that Caleb has. He could do so many things. Well, uh, people are talking about him being the most likely one and done in this group. That's I'm just relaying what other people have been telling me. I don't really know. I haven't looked at that far. I think he's good enough. And I think if he plays to that level that the team will be fine, they'll be fine in his hands. It's a different, mm-hmm. different sport now, Jacob. Oh, for sure. <laughs> For sure. yeah, true freshman point guards every year. Coaches would have been scared to death 15 oh, yeah. years ago about that, but but not anymore. Mm-hmm. Focus on the last. Or not, as, or not as much anymore. I yeah, not as that. much anymore. Yeah. Exactly. You wouldn't definitely wouldn't mind having a veteran point guard, but true freshman playing a lot of minutes in college basketball is is a very common thing now. Focus on the last three guys. We'll kind of just tie them in together. Yeah. R.J. Davis, Puff Johnson, Kerwin Walton. I think. Their guys are going to have to play. They're going to have to contribute something to this team just because when you look at Carolina's roster from last season, just don't have a lot of guards coming back that have proven a lot and that have played a lot. Where do you see those three guys coming in and helping? And if you had to pick one, is there one of those three guys that you think sees a lot more minutes? Because I think for me, it would probably be R.J. Davis just based on the type of kind of elite score he was in high school. Because if Carolina can translate that to the college level, if we can get R.J. Davis – playing at a high level and scoring at a high level like he did in high school, I think that would be great for this team because that's one guard position. They just they don't have a reliable score right now uh, that they can rely on from last year's team. I, I think to answer that question, you have to ask yourself, what is Anthony Harris going to give them first? That's a good point. Anthony Harris only played a handful of games last year, but he gave them energy. Mm-hmm. He was a defensive president. That, the game out in Vegas, the defense that he played against UCLA, and he gave them some spunk offensively in that game, he played really well. Did. And and you could tell that with his performance, the team got some energy from it. He, and then, of course, he, he injured him. He, he blew out the knee against Yale, and that was an enormous deflator. But those guys knew what he had battled back. I know you didn't ask about him, but I think it's important because if Anthony Harris can give them what a lot of people believe that he can, and what he was showing us last year before the injury, what he was capable of doing even at that point, coming off of an injury and going into one, Maybe R.J. Davis won't be asked to do as much this year. So maybe the answer to your question might be one of the other two. Because you've got Leakey out there at the wing at the three. Maybe they need that other three out there. Maybe Leakey struggles. Maybe he doesn't shoot well. He shot 22% or whatever it was from three-point range last year. He's going to have to shoot better than that to stay on the court. Maybe Puff is a really good shooter. Maybe everything that we've heard is Puff is much further ahead than Cam was at this point. Yeah. Cam was, was almost an afterthought to a lot of people. Puff is much, much higher rated. Maybe some of that has to do with the attention that Cam's gotten, but I don't think so. I don't, the recruiting people that I know and talk to, they don't base it on siblings or who your dad was or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Puff's probably just a better player at this stage. Is he ready to give them 15 minutes a game out on the wing? Is Kerwin Walton ready to give them 15 minutes out there? I think that I think one of those two might – be more the answer to the question because I I think a healthy Anthony Harris gives his team so much of what it will need. Gives them a defensive guy, gives them someone who can put the ball on the floor and get to the basket, someone who can shoot a three-pointer. He's got to get better, a little awkward release, I guess, on that. Mm-hmm. But still, he hit several last year, a high percentage of the limited sample size that we saw. Energy, energy, energy. Roy loves energy. You can get up and down the court. So they may not need R.J. Davis to do what a lot of people think that he will be asked to do. And R.J. may also spend a lot of time as the backup point guard as well. So um, it's going to be fun to watch this play out because it never ends up in March. 
the way you write it down on paper in September. And that's the fun thing about this. So you know, the answer to that question could be anything. It really could. But I think the Anthony Harris is sort of the, 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 the link here that we have to consider when you, when you yeah. look ahead of what those guys might be able to do. That might be asked to do. Last question I'll leave you with before we end this, AJ. I know it was a bad year for Carolina last year. Uh, expectations got to be back like they've always been. Do you expect this team to compete for the ACC championship to, you know, go deep in March? Is that something that's a realistic expectation for this yeah. team? Yeah, I think I think I have a lot of – and, again, I talk to a lot of people who've seen these guys play, and they, they understand what incoming freshmen in North Carolina and Duke and Michigan State and those programs – Kentucky look like before as they're in that process of becoming incoming freshmen and they kind of have an idea of what ones have helped in the past and what ones haven't they kind of know what that look is these guys have the look Kessler Love and Sharp have the look of guys who are going to play right away and help right away so that's three dudes then you think about the five they have coming back when you include Harris that's eight so an eight-man rotation is perfectly fine other guys will play for a while but when you go to Durham when you go to Charlottesville and you go to Louisville and the Carrier Dome and you get into March in the postseason, if you got eight, especially given the structure of these eight, you've got enough balance, you've got enough bigs, you've got enough perimeter stuff. They're going to have to get some three-point shooting and they're going to have to go to run. And, you know, four of these guys are bigs, but, you know, Armando ran pretty well at times last year. Kessler can run up and down the floor. Dayron is more athletic. I think that a lot of people – Get. And Garrison's going to be able to do everything that Roy wants. I mean, he, he's a full program Carolina guy now. He can do all that stuff. So uh, there aren't many limitations in his game. So, yeah, I think that they are a team that has a chance to win the ACC. They're definitely a team that has a chance to get to the Final Four. They're, they're sort of normal Carolina again, just a little bit on the younger side. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. AJ, it's, it's almost that time of year again. Football starts here in, 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 a, couple, in a few days. And- then we've got basketball ramping up right after. So we've been busy at Tar Illustrated 24-7, 365 days a year, but things are going to get a little bit uh, busier over on our end uh, coming up here soon. But that's why we love it. So, AJ, thanks for coming on here with me. A lot of things to be excited about basketball-wise uh, for Carolina, and, and I think we can all agree they should have a lot better season than they did last year. But for, for Andrew Jones, I've been Jacob Turner. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you've enjoyed the video, be sure to like, be sure to share and also be sure to check out tarheillustrated.com. Um, like I said, we cover Carolina football, basketball, recruiting 365 days a year. So if you're interested in what's going on that front, check us out over at tarheillustrated.com and be sure to subscribe to, to us here on YouTube at Tar Hill Illustrated. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for stopping by.